So I didn't tell my wife I was preaching today. And when I left the house, I said, man, I hope whoever's preaching today does well. <laughs> because I really need it. <laughs> but uh, um, there is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. I'll say it again. There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. And when we plant that Word in our lives, in the lives of others, it results in something that nothing else on earth could achieve. And this is the power that we have in our hands all the time, in our mouths, in our hearts, this, this power of the Word of God. And so today I'm going to talk about the power of a seed mindset, of a seed mindset. So in our world that we are living in today, if you are not seed-minded and you are need-minded or problem-minded, you can wake up and have a very different uh, 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 experience looking at the world today. I, uh, I was watching, uh, I love uh, Instagram Reels. Anybody else? Like I feel like that's an important part of my day is just forwarding Reels to different people. <laughs> but... Anyway, there was one reel and this woman was talking about that her son identifies as a cat. And so she took her son, and she was serious, so she took her son to the vet. And the vet, the vet wouldn't work on her son. Uh, and so she said, this is discrimination and all of these things. And I was reading some of the comments and, and one of the comments said, don't take your son to Springfield, Ohio. Which, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably better. But, but we can look at the world and we can look at all the craziness and darkness and the sin and all the stuff going on. And, and we can come to the conclusion that our world is finished, that America's finished, that sin is winning, darkness is taking over if we are need-minded. If we are seed-minded and we believe in the Word of God and the power of the Word of God, that it calls itself sharper than a two-edged sword, we can look at all of this going on and say, there is great opportunity for God to do amazing things. Amen? One of my favorite passages is about Isaac, and it says that he planted during a famine. There was a great famine on the land and Isaac planted. He planted a seed and it says, and then he, he reaped a great harvest. That is the word of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. That there can be a, a barren land. It can be somebody's life. It can, it can be somebody's health. It can, whatever it might be. It can be a marriage. It can be whatever that it looks desolate and dying and the Word of God is the only thing that has the power to bring that back to life. And this is the power that we have every time we open up the Word of God, every time we speak the Word of God, every time we write the Word of God. It is the most powerful seed that we can sow. The question is, are you seed-minded or are you need-minded? The seeds of today are the flowers of tomorrow. Who knows that? The seeds of today are the flowers of tomorrow. How many of you have ever walked through a Home Depot? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have the most beautiful gardens? Please raise your hand. One person. <laughs> Thank you. Do you know that all of us walk past everything needed if you've been in a Home Depot Everything needed to have a beautiful garden. Who agrees? In fact, they put those little seed pods, they may even have them at HEB. We all walk past the opportunity to have it, but don't do anything with those seeds. And so our gardens are barren and ugly and whatever else it might be. And that's the point. We have been given everything needed for life and godliness. 
We have been given everything needed for life and godliness because of Jesus and having the Holy Spirit. And we, we have these seeds that we have been given through the Word of God. But if we leave them on the shelf, it will profit us nothing. And you can wish and hope. Wish and hope doesn't get those seeds in the ground. And so think about every time you pass a seed packet, you are choosing to rather be need-minded saying, oh, I don't have time for that. But seed-minded makes time to say, I'm going to plant this seed because the seeds of today are the flowers of tomorrow. So let me ask the things that are going on in our lives, the things that we are facing. It doesn't matter how awful things are right now. You have the opportunity to plant seeds that will change your future down the line. Who agrees? How many of you can remember, maybe it's in your childhood or something, but you can think back to times where you thought my life is completely over. There's no coming back from this. Anybody? A few times, yeah. Uh, uh, one of my bigger ones that I've shared before was um, my mom had bought a, um, a BMW as an investment because in South Africa, cars actually went up in value because they were, they were hard to get. So she had got this BMW at a great price and we were going to sell it and that was going to pay for a bunch of stuff. And I had a girlfriend at the time and uh, we only get our driver's licenses at 18. So I didn't know how to drive yet, but I took this car to impress my girlfriend and a little while later, the car was in two parts. It was terrible. And I remember sitting there as all of this were unra was, was unraveling and I was thinking like, I will never come back from this. Like, my life is over. Now we laugh about it now, but at the time, I mean, there was just, I couldn't see a future hope. But what I'm telling you, in the worst of circumstances, of situations, seeds can be planted that change the future. So you're never stuck when it comes to the gospel. This is why the gospel is so incredible. It's because nobody is without hope when it comes to Jesus. I met a man, uh, uh, this was several years ago. His name was Tommy. And uh, he was a beautiful speaker, uh, just a beautiful human being. And I was like, man, if I could know Jesus the way this guy knows Jesus. I met him in a prison ministry. He had served for 18 years in prison for murder. Now tell me what else besides the gospel can take whatever path that he was on and seeds were sown in his life that could put him on such a different path later in life. In the first service, I, I, I asked Pastor Arthur some questions. I said, who led him? to Christ? Who led his, his mom to Christ? It was the grandmother. The grandmother of this family sowed a seed in leading his mom to Christ. Think about this. And here we are sitting here. And I'm going to read a verse that completely explains what I'm talking about. Are you ready? Okay, listen to this and I'm going to come back to this point. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. Brilliant. Man, Jesus was so good. What does this mean? I'll give you an example of, of this family. So the grandmother leads his mom to Christ, and now we are sitting in Velocity Church. Do you think she had any idea when she sowed that seed that this would grow into this kind of plant where us, the birds, are now making nests and in its shade? Come on, somebody. It was uh, uh, more of a clap deserved than that, but I'm not offended. I forgive you. It's incredible. If you could talk to her and, and one day in heaven say, did you have any idea? She'd be like, I had no idea. I was just sowing a seed. I was just faithful to sow a seed. And this is what the gospel does. It changes whole generations. That is why we can step into any situation, whether it's death, 
whether it's sickness, loss, divorce, whatever it might be, with compassion, but also with confidence. Because there is always something that Jesus can do in every situation to revive what is dead and to make whole what is broken. That is the power of the gospel. And when we are sowing this, we are planting plants that will be yielding fruits for generations to come. Why don't you put up that slide, please, uh, Sam? And don't give me your churchy answer. Give me your honest first thought. What do you see when you see that? A lot of work. Who said that? Yeah. What else? What else do you see there? Who looks at that and goes like, oh, that is so beautiful. No. no. It's, it feels like a lot of work. It, it, listen, if you're standing in front of that field and you see how massive it is, it might even feel hopeless. But this is the power of a seed. When we are seed-minded versus need-minded, we can look at something like that and say, hey, it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next week. It may not even be next year. But I know that by planting seeds in this field, this is going to change and it is going to transform. And this is, I, I, I've seen this so many times with wayward kids. Often on, on, online, uh, moms write to me and ask me to pray for their wayward kids and ask for advice and everything like that. And it is my great pleasure to just quote back what Scripture says. Train up a child in the way they should go and when they are old, they're not depart. And they write back to me to say, but they have departed. And I say, don't discount your seeds. Won't you put the flower field up, please, Sam? Now, that didn't just happen on its own. Somebody was purposeful about sowing these seeds. And, and many times, we forget that there is a promise that these seeds are going to bloom. And I'm going to read that to you. And same with the kids. The seeds are sown and they can run and they can go and they can do whatever. But that seed is planted and one day it is going to bloom. My dad, we prayed for him every day. My mom would wake us up 6.30, give us some cornflakes, put our socks on, which was awesome. I try to get my wife to do that. She's not as interested, but... And my mom would read us the scripture and we would pray. We would pray for, for uh, my dad. We would pray for Ethiopia, you know. In Africa, there was other African countries. They would like pray for them. In America, you just pray for Africa because it's one country to you, the whole place. <laughs> and we prayed for my dad every day, every day, every day, every day. We would sow that seed. We would sow that seed. We would sow that seed because we believe that not one prayer is wasted. Who, who, who believes that? I absolutely believe that. Have I seen things not come? Sure, but I don't, I, I, I don't believe that prayers are wasted. Every prayer you pray, it achieves something. And after my dad passed, I found out that the last thing, one of the last things he did on his computer was watch a video that I'd recorded years before leading somebody to cross. So it took his whole lifetime, but those seeds weren't wasted. And here's the reason why. Listen to this. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. So question, does the earth still remain? It's not a trick question. We are still here. So then there is planting and harvest. Well, Brent, I think... I think uh, the Bible's talking about physical seeds, not, oh, that's a great uh, statement. Now, let me read you this. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So it doesn't matter what the area, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, whatever you are sowing, being generous, being kind, you will reap what you sow. So as you're sowing in the ground, and as you're sowing in the ground, and as you're sowing in the ground, you will reap. 
But there's something about having seed mindset that you don't just put it in and then tomorrow you've got a banana tree. Look, this is, we, we, we've got a fruit orchard. It's, it's taken years. We got one piece of fruit after like three years. Do you hear what I'm saying? It takes time to tend it, to care for it. This is what a seed mindset has. So you can look at the most desolate of places and have hope to know I'm putting these seeds in today, but a time will come where there will be a harvest. These people who move their families to, to rough neighborhoods to go share the gospel, missionaries are going to places hostile to the gospel purely because they believe that by sowing these seeds, it may not be in their lifetime, there's gonna be a harvest. So no, you cannot mock the justice of God. When you plant, you will reap. When you sow, you will reap. Won't you put up the next slide there, please, Sam? Of the guy and his bicycle. This is a true story from the news. This guy lost 400 pounds. Amazing. Come on, somebody. It's amazing. But how did he do it? You see, we, we, we're living in this time where we just want to take a pill or we want to do something. And, so, you know, you hear about a friend who took a pill and lost 50 pounds the next day. Yes, because they were dead. <laughs> when you are seed-minded, there, there are no quick fixes. This guy didn't do this overnight, but do you know how he started? By planting the seed of walking. I bet you everybody who's 400 pounds wants to say, oh, I wish I could lose 400 pounds. But not everybody's willing to sow the seed. When I was a young kid, uh, uh, I didn't have many friends. And my mom would always say, what Scripture says in the Proverbs, if you want friends, be friendly. Sow the seed. Sow the seed. If you're struggling with something in your life, you sow the seed for that thing. I'm so proud of this guy. And here's the thing. What I love about this picture, he's continuing to sow seeds for his future. This wasn't an overnight thing. The reason why I put up this picture, because this is, this is an achievable human being on this planet who decided to sow seeds for his future. Even though he was in a very tough situation. He said, I'm starting to sow seeds today for my health tomorrow. And it took a long time. So let me ask you, are we ever without excuse? Whatever is going on, whether you are in a tough financial state, whether you are in a, a tough relationship state, whatever it might be, you may not be able to fix this tomorrow, but you can start sowing seeds today. Here's how we're going to learn to be seed-minded versus need-minded. When you are seed-minded, you think about future growth versus immediate gratification. One of the biggest killers of corruption in the government, in whatever country we grew up with this in South Africa, they would have a huge fund for, say, new parks or for, for education or whatever it might be. And then somebody would steal that. And so they had immediate gratification of being rich for that moment. But what they did was they killed the opportunities for people in the future. That's seed-minded versus need-minded. Seed-minded says, I'm putting this away. I'm investing this. I'm doing this so that the future can grow and I'm going to be without it today. But when I have it in the future, it's going to be far more. There, there is a real fight against immediate gratification, and that's in all the things. I think most of the, 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 the beauty industry is, is running on immediate gratification. Am I right? Versus, yeah, you can do this. He has a personal trainer that's going to take you two years. You're like, oh, I don't have two years. <laughs> no, you do. And then it lasts. When I'm seed-minded, I'm thinking about the future. When I'm need-minded, I'm just 
I just want to fix right here, right now. And it never works. There are no easy fixes that work. Even super glue, right? It works for the moment, but it can't compare with rebuilding, renewing, restoring, whatever it might be. Generosity versus scarcity. Seed-minded people operate with a mindset of abundance. They believe in giving and planting into others, knowing that the seeds they sow will eventually multiply. Think about your life and the things that you need and the things that you're going through. How much are you thinking about others and asking God how you can sow into others? Remember when, when uh, Jesus was uh, with the multitude and they were hungry and the disciples were like, send them away. Let's get rid of them. Let's just take care of ourselves. Jesus like, no, you feed them. I bet you the disciples were hungry too. Right? And what did Jesus say? Think about others first. Take care of them first. God knows what our needs are. He is the need supplier. But he wants us to live a life of faith. And nothing says faith more than when you are generous when you don't have enough for yourself. And it's possible. The Bible says, even if you give a cup of cold water, there's not many of us that can't supply a cup of cold water. The difference that that can make, that seed. I've, I've spoken about when I ran my half marathon and I, 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 I grew to love those people who volunteered to stand on the side and just fill up water cups. God bless those people. And, and you're like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> throw it in my face. God bless those people. We are those people. We get to be those people every single day. When we get online, when we go out to work, when we in the, the parking lot and, and somebody's like super aggressive about a parking space, it's okay. It's okay. God bless them for stealing your parking place because you got to burn extra calories today. You hear what I'm saying? It's just a whole different mindset of how we're approaching things. I need a parking place. Lord, how do I sow a seed here today? This person's obviously going through something tough. Anything I can do. Hey, you have it. And we don't always get immediate gratification. That's the thing. You sow the parking place and the person flips you the bird and cusses at you. And then you're like, Argh! no, no, no. You still sowed the seed. The seed is in there. Don't think because it went in the ground, a plant doesn't pop up immediately. Neither do your seeds that you are sowing of love, of kindness, of all of these things. I, I heard a story, and I, I wish I could remember all the details, but a, a true story of an army sergeant and a private. And the private was a believer, and the army sergeant was not. He, 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 he hated Christians for whatever reason. And he made this private's life living hell. And, it, and, and it, it eventually culminated with the, the army sergeant pushing the private into the wall or something and splitting his head and, and him bleeding on the floor. This is after months and months and months. And, he, and the private went down and started cleaning up the blood. And he looked at the sergeant and said, if Jesus could shed his blood for you, so can I. And all those seeds, those seeds, those seeds, those seeds, those seeds, those seeds. That was the day the sergeant gave his life to Christ. There may not be instant gratification when it comes to sowing in people's lives and loving our neighbor. We all want that hallmark moment where you're like, hey, neighbor, and they're like, oh, you know, and, and sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes you're like, hey, neighbor, and they're like, I hate you. <laughs> But somebody has to sow the seeds. Somebody has to be the gardener. Somebody has to believe that we can have beautiful gardens in our life. What about your family members that you don't talk to? Let me just ask this. It's for you to, to deal with the Lord on your own. But why did God put you in that family? 
There's got to be a reason. He could have put you anywhere. I said this to my son. I said, you understand that you existed before you came to earth, right? Because I believe that life comes from God. So he didn't just come alive before. When he came to the earth, he was already alive. I said, and out of all the human beings and families that God could have sent you to, he sent you to us, right? That's a big deal. It's not just a random thing that I got my son and my daughter. No, it was on purpose. Same thing for your family, same thing for your jobs, whatever it might be. doesn't mean it's forever. But while you are there, be the best gardener that you can be and sow those seeds and don't look for immediate gratification. Do it for the future. Faith versus fear. Seed-minded individuals have faith that they will, what they plant will grow even when they cannot see the results. They trust the process and are not discouraged by slow progress. Anybody? Need-minded individuals are driven by fear of not having enough or failing to meet their current needs, which often leads to hoarding resources or avoiding risks. If the Lord supplies our needs, then yes, as an opportunity comes, we can have faith. We can take the chance. And most likely, the Lord's never going to call you to follow him out of a pla- in a place of comfort. And the Lord said, come follow me and here's $10 million and this and this and this. You won't have to worry about anything. No. Because then there's no faith. No, the Lord says, get out of the boat where you are probably going to drown and you don't float because of gravity and walk over here. That's more like what he does. And if you don't have a faith mindset, you will never be able to do that. You will look at your seed and go like, no, no, I can't let this go. This is all I have. Not realizing as long as you hold on to it, it is all you'll have. But when you sow it, when you plant it, when you give it away, in faith, the Lord multiplies it. And this is the, this is the principle of sowing and reaping. You can count the seeds in an orange, but you can never count the oranges in a seed. Deep. That should be in a fortune cookie somewhere. (laughs) So you sit there and go like, hmm, before you load up on MSG. (laughs) Contribution versus self-centeredness. Seed-minded people are focused on making a positive contribution in the lives of others, knowing that uh, as they plant into others, it'll come back in various ways. When need-minded, tend to focus on themselves and what they can gain, often neglecting opportunities to sow into others or their community. We try to do this all the time. As a family, as a business, whatever it is. Last time I preached, I spoke about that a guest said, what if we could have something for autistic children? And I said, well, why can't we do that? So on January 3rd, I think it is, we are opening up the ranch for free, and we are going to put on an incredible spread and show and everything for families who have autistic children. Now, it's for free. There is no direct correlation in us doing that with what our needs are on the ranch. That doesn't help us get to our goal at all. You hear what I'm saying? But it is something that we can sow, and that's what's so important. We look at what's in our hand and what we can do to sow versus what do we need. No, no, we look at what can we give. What can we do? What do we have? We've done things where we've given away nights for people who are going through a hard time. Like, if you're going through a hard time, like, come, we'll take care of you. Now, that didn't help us at all for our goals. But we're in the kingdom of God. And so we sow seeds, and we sow seeds, whatever it, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's just, a, it's just a Coke, right? It's just giving a Coke away to somebody or telling someone they look beautiful or 
uh, uh, telling somebody they can do it. It doesn't always have to be elaborate things. It can be very simple things. Think about things that people have said to you that change your whole trajectory. I, I remember this one coach, uh, I, I was playing soccer. We play soccer in primary school and rugby in high school. That's how we did it in South Africa. And, and I really wasn't doing well at soccer. Um, I was made for rugby, <laughs> right? And anyway, and uh, uh, this one coach the one day said something to me. It's like, I've never seen anybody throw the ball in like you. You are so good at that. Like it changed my whole approach. One sentence. He sowed a seed. And then I became the best ball thrower in you'd ever seen. But you have the power to sow those seeds every single day with what we say, what we do, what we give, inviting people, whatever it is. You don't have to be rich to make an incredible difference on this earth. We often think, oh, if I had money, if I, you know, if I was Brad Pitt, then I could do something. No, no. If God wanted you to be Brad Pitt, you would be Brad Pitt. He wanted you to be you in the situation you're in to trust Him where you are right now. You don't have to be anybody different. That's why this whole thing of changing who we are goes against God's image for you. Hear what I'm saying? He doesn't make mistakes. So we sow the seeds that we have because we believe in the future and we aren't self-centered. We want to contribute to other people's lives all the time. A growth set versus a fixed mindset. Seed-minded people embrace, embrace the growth mindset. They believe in continually learning improvement and progress. They know planting seeds leads to growth in all areas of our lives. When you are stretching and sowing and trusting, guess what? Not only your life changes, everybody's life changes. And that was the example we used with what happened in the Morgan family. You hear what I'm saying? It's not just about me and you, but it is about us doing something. Need-minded people are more likely to have a fixed mindset believing that their abilities and resources are limited. They often feel stuck in their current situation. You're not stuck. You are never stuck because every day you can sow a seed. Even if that seed is on your knees praying, if that's all you can do, if you are in a prison cell and you can do nothing other than pray, you are sowing a seed that guarantees your future will change. Think about that. Either you are in awe of what I'm saying or you think I'm lying. Which one? This is how powerful the Word of God is. But just like those seeds in Home Depot, you can choose to leave it on the shelf and nothing happen in your life. Or you choose to tear that packet open and at least do something with it. Thank you. And last one, purpose-driven versus problem-driven. Seed-minded individuals are driven by purpose. They plant seeds with intention, believing that their actions today will align with a greater goal or vision for the future. Need-minded individuals are often driven by problems. They are more focused on addressing immediate challenges rather than planting seeds that prevent future issues. I said this in the first service, but sometimes we actually have to tear down some stuff and actually looks like we're going backwards in order to plant seeds. When we bought the ranch and had a house, and so it was going to be like a reasonable remodel that we were doing. But, you know, we had that big freeze and the pipes burst. And anyway, the house was, the house was a bit of a mess, but I was still going to just do a reasonable remodel. Because otherwise, that meant there was no bathrooms, nowhere to sleep, except a barn for animals. But you know what? Sometimes you sow seeds in uncomfortable situations because you believe in the future. And a friend came to me, put his arm around me, and said, you need to tear this sucker down. And we did. And that meant we had to sleep in a barn, sleep in my car. We had to cook on a little grill, you know, whatever it might be. It was not comfortable. It was, it was not the most amazing experience. 
Nobody was saying, this is the greatest thing of my life. And often to, to plant the seeds that we need to do, sometimes it means actually getting uncomfortable. It actually means feeling like you're stepping backwards, whatever it might be. But you believe in the future and you believe in the seed that we have been given. And God says his word will not return void. For me, this really hits home. I had a, a terrible rage, like, like proper rage. Like where you see a shark before it bites and its eyes go all black, like that kind of rage. That it, it got to the stage where it would become uncontrollable and I just go crazy. So much so that I canceled my, uh, uh, my wedding with Daniela. Because I never wanted her to be in a situation that my mother was in with my dad. Even though I hated him doing that to my mom, I was scared I was going to do it because I could not control this rage. You want to know how powerful the gospel is? Sitting in a Baptist church. Why I say Baptist? Because it was as calm as can be, right? Nobody was uh, doing anything. No one was running around. Nobody was speaking in tongues. Nobody was laying hands and all those things are wonderful. But I want you to know, the Word of God was preached and, and the pastor shared, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I'd heard that verse so many times, but on that day, that seed became that flower field. I didn't shake, I didn't foam at the mouth, I didn't do anything. There was just this, this breaking that happened in my heart. And my wife has never known a lifestyle like that. Right? That's how powerful the gospel is. And when that happened to me, I was like, there's, there's nothing greater that I can share than the gospel. Because I knew how trapped I was with that rage, how much I hated myself for it. But I just could not get free. But guess what? Seed, seed, seed. I didn't, I, I didn't enjoy sitting in church as a child, I must tell you. Three hour services, you must be kidding. You think three, three songs is a lot at Velocity? Try like 25. And then as they're leading, they get inspired again by the Holy Spirit and then they're back again. You're like, sit down. <laughs> I'd do anything just to pass the time sitting in church. But you know what? Seed, 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 seed. Even though I didn't want to be there. Seed, 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 seed. You hear what I'm saying? There is nothing more powerful than the Word of God sown in our lives. And you are not stuck. You are not hopeless. Your situation's not hopeless. But so with faith. And now I'd like Pastor Arthur to come talk about the greatest seed. Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brent. 